Good evening in Costa Rica and good morning in Japan. How are you, Mr. Patrick Newell? Ah, uh, I'm doing wonderful. It's uh, so wonderful and beautiful to be in Japan during this time of year. It's kind of fall turning to winter, getting a little bit cold, but people are, are happy and healthy. That's great to hear. It's funny that today is uh, officially the beginning of the summer in Australia. So. <laughs> <laughs> the differences that we have around the world it's fascinating you know we we have this northern hemisphere paradigm mentality or mindset uh, but people we know and we care a lot about are from the southern hemisphere and they have a different a different angle to see things it's the same the same that happens when when you're having a conversation with uh, a woman and they have a completely different approach. And I think that the celebration of diversity in humanity means that as we identify similarities that bring us together, we also identify differences that enrich us mutually. So uh, what, I, what we would like to do today is to have a conversation the same way we talk all the time when we talk uh, about what we think the future will bring in at least three industries, and maybe we can even jump around. We don't have to stick to a, to a script. Uh, we, we've been talking for months now about the future of education. Uh, we would also like to talk about the future of tourism, which is uh, so pertinent both for, for Costa Rica and for Japan and for many other countries, and also the future of food uh, and how COVID is probably accelerating exponentially these three. Uh, I remember maybe to put into context uh, the first topic that we are going to discuss. A year ago, exactly a year ago, there was uh, a webinar that Peter Diamandis was uh, co-hosting with uh, Tony Robbins. And they were talking about the disruption of um, online learning or the disruption of education. And they, they mentioned a fact that was just mind blowing. They said that up until December of 2019, the education, the online education industry was valued at a billion dollars, a billion dollars a day. Uh, it was a $300 billion industry. And they said one year ago that that industry was going to was about to be disrupted and then COVID came. So what has happened? Uh, how do we see today uh, the future of education? Should we even still call it education or should we find another name? I guess these are the things that we wanted to discuss today. What are your thoughts? So three extremely important topics. If you think about it, how we feed our brain or feed our soul through what I like to call learning, how we feed our body and nurture our body to give us the energy to do things, which is food. And the third is the different lenses and how we experience and see the world through tourism are three, probably some of the most important topics to really speak about. And if you go into the area of what I like to call instead of education learning, um, there is going to be so many different things happening um, with the convergence of tech technology. I mean, what's interesting, if you think about what is the purpose of learning or what is the purpose of it, if you want to speak about children, of children going to school and learning particular content. For me, learning or learning environments in many ways have a, a couple of core focuses. One is when you go to a learning environment, how does it nurture you to feel like you can try new things and do new things and you feel comfortable? And also that you have the emotional and this collaborative or reaches what I call the highest level of creative collective intelligence, which is the ability to make and create and do things together. I think for learning environments, I think that's probably the most important thing. 
what the governments think we should be learning typically has a lot of merit, but most of it really doesn't have any relevance in our life. Um, of course, learning to read and write and to think critically and creatively are very important, but right now, uh, most of what we're being asked to learn within a school environment by the different boards of education or ministries of education really don't align very well with nurturing our critical thinking nor our creativity in general. And so when you think about learning, it's like, well, why do you learn? What should you learn? And how do you really nurture that curiosity that's within us? And so the model has been, you know, somebody shares with you a bunch of information that they think is relevant. You receive it. And then if you're in a class environment, you might raise your hand if you have the courage to do so and ask a question, but it could be a stupid question. So maybe you don't feel so confident asking a question or you're just so excited and highly curious that you might ask a question or even worse, a teacher says to you, Patrick, uh, what do you think the answer to this question is? And you're sitting there in fear that the teacher is going to call on you. I'm not sure that's really the healthiest environment to nurture us as learners, as well as the person who happens to be the teacher in that particular situation. They may not be the best person to be teaching you that particular subject area or that content. And so the natural kind of move forward now that we have technology that's allowing us to listen to the master teachers in the world share content in a way that really is interesting, engaging with depth that is extraordinary versus somebody who has some knowledge in an area, maybe just a little bit more than the students do and shares that limited knowledge with some confidence, but not the level of confidence that a master teacher that would deliver it with the energy and vibrance that somebody who's extremely passionate about that area would share, I think has a very different energetic kind of feeling and, and, and energy to it. So when you think about looking at the future of learning and the opportunity to um, also learn at our own pace, I think the opportunities are extraordinary. Where we, uh, what's been a challenge for adults has been that we go and spend four years and focus a lot of time and go and get a degree and we put our life on hold. And I think in some ways that's really wonderful because it's really more about us learning to be an adult and to be self-sufficient a lot of times than it is really what we learn while we're at university. But we put our life on hold in many ways because we aren't working. And then you look at a lot of other degrees that require you to put your life on hold or there, there is already that hybrid model where you're working and you're going to school at the same time but it's pretty intense and it's pretty full on. It's not a very well-balanced life, right? So I think there's a lot of areas in which um, we're not really aligning with what our needs are as humans or, or, or finding our balance in many ways. And the other thing that really doesn't make a lot of sense is that we're really thinking that, uh, that people will learn the same things at the same time at the same pace which the only time in our life that I can think about that we really ask people to learn the same thing at the same time at the same pace is in a school environment. And, and I think that's just bizarre that we've somehow created that. Now we know historically we've done that for the kind of industrial model of people working in factories, right? So I think there's humongous potential to shift how we learn. And I shared with you once before an idea that I had, two ideas actually. One is that schools really need to become community centers. And if you imagine a school is open from seven to seven and with all the wonderful facilities that schools have and students were able to go and choose and do things that they really like to do and prefer to do and wanted to go deeper. Now that could be someone in, in arts, that could be in science, that could be in technology, that could be in sports, it could be whatever they have a particular passion for. It doesn't mean that we would neglect what the governments are saying the students would learn, we would just do it in a different way. 
we'd probably do it online with master teachers at each child's own pace. The other thing that I shared with you before is that how we're assessing human beings right now is also kind of interesting. We're typically using a number to assess somebody. And that has to be one of the most shallowest ways to really get an understanding of who a human being is. And I think it was Daniel Goleman that says that really 20% of humans' success is on our kind of academic ability. There was somebody else recently that shared with me, and I don't know where the statistic came from or the data came from, but that very little of our success actually has to do with our intellectual capacity. Now, if we are, um, you know, we have some intellectual challenges, of course, that would be an issue. But if we are just of normal intelligence, the actual level of intelligence doesn't have as much uh, to do with our success as maybe our curiosity or our passion or motivation, our focus on doing something and connecting that knowledge with it. Very interesting. I, I, I always like to hear you speak, uh, especially given the decades of experimentation and experience, which is probably the result of experimentation that you've gained in the field of education. Uh, and I, I think that from that, uh, from that motivation that I heard a year ago to COVID, to what we've seen today, um, I think the digital economy just uh, flew in to stay. Uh, uh, growing exponentially. If you see what e-commerce, what has happened to e-commerce uh, in 2020, it has grown 10 times faster than the pace of growth of the last 10 years. Um, and with e-learning or with learning in general, because not everyone has access to, to the e part of learning, um, I feel that the, the radical shift that has occurred this year, and maybe we are still in the early stages of the new paradigm to, to, to tell if this is true or not, if, if my hypothesis holds true, is that from now on, the, 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 the main actors and actresses of the education system is actually the learner. So I agree with you. We should talk about learning from now on, uh, but also we should talk about learners and how they are learning um, and what they are learning. And I would say that the combination of how and what is uh, coming from within each individual. So exactly what you're saying, we are entering the age of tailor-made learning. And this tailor-made learning with the technological tools we have today it's it's already there. I mean, could you put together a curriculum of the the most interesting 40 hours of content you would like to learn in the month of December out of YouTube and blogs? And I'm sure, of course you could. And or you could sign up for some already predetermined course in some university that makes it available for free or even for a few dollars if you want a credit for it. So this disruption has even uh, brought us in 2020 solutions or ideas like uh, what Google has done, that they have announced a series of online courses for learners to uh, gain uh, a context and a content that requires 120 hours of work so that's five hours a week for 20. Sorry, hold on. That's not 120. I'm, I'm, my math is wrong. It's 20 hours, five hours a week. That's 100 hours of effort for about $60 for those uh, six months or whatever long. And if you perform well in those courses, according to Google's artificial intelligence assessment platforms, you could be hired by Google and by another uh, list of digital companies that are looking for exactly those skills in their uh, working population from now until uh, the not so distant future, right? So 
it, it, it doesn't discriminate. You don't have to be a university graduate. You don't even have to be an adult to take those courses. Um, Google and all these companies are ready to offer uh, contracts to minors that perform well in, in these programs. So it's about the motivation of the individual, what they want and how they approach it and how they do it and why, what they've done for the last few years in their lives. So I think we've turned the page of standardized learning. Uh, it doesn't mean we're, we're, we're not gonna see any more of it, we will, but it's clearly a paradigm that belongs in the past. Yeah, I think you had brought up an, ex an interesting point, you know, a few interesting points actually. One is, well, one you didn't share and I kind of alluded to a little bit is that the governments I think will always tell us what they think we should learn. And so there will be a ministry of education or whatever. I don't think that's probably going to go away. It would be nice if it does, but I think they, the government will, and, and you'll know because you were a government official for quite a while. There's a certain sense of we want to, I don't know if the word control is the right word, but to kind of somewhat guide our learners to be literate, to have certain basic knowledge. And it'd be wonderful if it changes, but it's hard for me to see that happening in the next 10 or 20 years, but who knows? The other thing is what skills? One of the biggest interesting challenges that people, I shouldn't say challenges, but I ask a lot of HR people, I ask a lot of people, what are the future skills? And very few people can actually answer that question. Now, more and more, I think people are starting to become aware of that. And then how do you learn the future skills? And I think in a lot of ways, the program that Google US mentions offering probably aligns with that a lot. But are the skills that we're learning or the aptitudes that we're developing, are they really preparing us for our future? And, you know, I, I giggle all the time because I was not very much into technology or sci-fi or any of those things. And then I got connected with Singularity University about four years ago, and I started to see what I love to do is connect the unconnected. And I started to see this convergence of all these different technologies getting ready to create this exponential curve that we talk about um, in this exponential world. And I started saying, wow, what if this and this and this, it's like making a meal comes together, creates this amazing spicy taco that has a taste that just knocks you out kind of thing, but using that with technologies and to move learning forward, how amazing would that be? And so that's been really, uh, I think, interesting for me to think about. And you mentioned AI a little bit. One of the things I've been really looking at is how is technology changing how we learn or what we learn? And so, one example, like, so if you mentioned AI, I think AI is getting really close to being able to assess humans, even at the same level, possibly even better than humans. And if you look at the ability for sound recognition and some of the other areas, and as they increase, I think it's going to be, they're going to be better and more, AI will be better and more accurate than most humans. And so all of a sudden you have a situation where you actually don't need that teacher or human to assess you as a learner. That will be done at a very high level of confidence using technology. And so I think that's a huge paradigm shift. And one example I, I've been kind of playing is that I sent a, a proposal to Yamaha Music. They have a bunch of music schools but they lose money on the schools. It's not a money maker, but they have music schools, so they sell musical instruments. But imagine if the first 12 or 20 songs that you learned were done with AI online and sound recognition with even kind of a recognition with your video and where your hands are on the different musical instrument. It may not be as good as a professional teacher, but you're not spending the $50 an hour or whatever for a private teacher and you're getting that for free. So all of a sudden Yamaha has all people do is buy a musical instrument and join their online program and they will sell a lot more instruments without the cost of running a school. Right. So that's a huge kind of just thinking about the paradigm shift for Yamaha and music schools kind of things and how that could change things. So for me, that's kind of interesting now how we use AI to assess 
learning and assess us as humans is one interesting thing. The other one is how we're using our brains. If you think about before and a really simple one is like, if you wanted to go somewhere, you used to have to write down or think about, okay, you look at a map and you say, okay, I go six blocks and I turn left at this light. And then I go another two blocks and I turn right. And then I do this and I do that and whatever. And you had to go through this whole process to actually go somewhere. And now you just use technology or was that, was that four years ago or five years ago that happened? Or was that, was that, was it the red or the blue or was it, and you just ask Dr. Google and Dr. Google will tell you right away, right? The answer. So we're starting to now use our brains in different ways. And then the other thing that I wanted to share is if you start to think about the whole thing about digital twins and how we're starting to basically store a digital version of our memory online. And then what's the relationship gonna be between our digital memory and our real memory? And how will we start using our brains differently to be more compatible with that digital memory? Because our memory changes, but the digital memory won't change unless we actually manipulate it to change. So I think that's gonna be fascinating moving forward for how we develop our brain and how we learn and, and who we are as learners. But the other part, so the technology is great and it'll take away a lot of different things for us. But probably the most important part when you think about learning is what I, I mentioned earlier is the creative collective intelligence. It's the humans and humans together in nature making things together and creating things together that I think will be the most impactful thing. And looking at, as you mentioned earlier, the similarities we have and, and embracing those. And then also looking at the differences or superpowers or strengths that we have that would add to that collective intelligence, intelligence in a way that would elevate what we're doing together at an amazing level. And so that's what excites me is connecting more with the humans again, more with nature again. And COVID has been a great a great a kind of example of that in some ways, the amount of people who've been, families who've been connecting more, although we're more connected online and we're Zoomed out, but at the same time, we've got a lot more family time and we've spent more time in nature than we probably have in the last whatever number of years. So that's, COVID's been a great example of what is possible in regard to that balance of, of that kind of human creative collective intelligence. I, I, I have a few reactions to what you said. Um, Number one, I wrote down a few minutes ago, co-learning, right? Uh, I guess experiential learning allows us to learn together. And I learn from you and you learn from me. And together we create a space that wouldn't have been created otherwise. So it's basically uh, a synergistic approach to learning. Second, um, the fact, uh, your, your reference to governments. You know, when, when Skype was created, what happened to the telcos of the world that were charging a very high price for international phone calls? They, they simply became obsolete. They were bypassed. Technology bypassed that. What happened when Uber came up with taxi companies, many of which have links to governments? They've been bypassed. They've had to figure out a solution. What is going to happen when photovoltaic electricity is cheaper than public electricity and you can harvest it yourself on your roof not, without even having to buy the hardware because someone is going to install it there and they're going to uh, charge you a fee for the service of generating that electricity which you are going to consume you're going to become a prosumer of your own energy um, these are technological bypasses to regulation so i believe that what we are seeing this year with e-learning, uh, the what and the how, is disrupting a public education as we knew it. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the skills, you ask the question, which skills? Uh, if you ask Harari, Yuval Harari, he would say that the two essential skills that we need to move forward in this future that is coming at exponential pace towards us is emotional intelligence, uh, another reference to Daniel Goldman that you mentioned uh, earlier, and also your ability to remain mentally and physically healthy. And here, technology plays an incredible role. I mean, today, uh, devices are capturing a lot of our bio data and giving us feedback, instant feedback on a day-to-day -day basis about 
how we're doing. And today you already have AI that is assisting doctors give you much better, more precise, earlier diagnosis than before. And at the same time, you're having doctors that are being trained with virtual reality, for example, or mixed reality. So a young medical student spends a few weeks or months in early in, in her career um, utilizing some uh, virtual reality helmets that allows them to experience what a red blood cell looks like and how it moves through your cardiovascular system or what does the liver do and you go into the liver for five minutes with this with this device that is very realistic it's experiential learning through technology in the comfort of your home so yeah. these I think are that's all... a great seg- i think it's a great segue to talking about tourism actually before i i move on uh, right. uh the last thing is the contact with nature that you mentioned and this leads me to the topic of bioliteracy which is actually uh, a topic that we have in common uh, the ability to speak the language of life how do we how do we assess that well the only way of doing it is, is being exposed to nature and trying to figure out what are the patterns and uh, how this language is spoken of course there's a lot to learn that has already been written about nature but if we think about biomimicry and our ability to imitate the way nature works and how it is resilient and how it regenerates and how it flourishes and how it is circular in a way that every single residue in a natural process becomes an input of some other natural process. So how can we imitate that circularity into our industry and into our life? Uh, I, I think it's very important especially when we think that right now we're in the midst of this fourth industrial revolution, everything is data, data, data. Very soon we're going to be entering the 5G revolution, which some claim is the fifth industrial revolution where technology is going to give you, I don't know, 20 times more capabilities than the ones you have today. You're gonna be able, a, a medical surgeon is going to be able to practice a surgery remotely. I can extract your tooth from where I am to where you are, if we use the proper software and the proper hardware that is going to actually remove the tooth from you, but I'll be operating it from here. Um, And then we're gonna reach the sixth industrial revolution, which in many places it has already started. And this is what Singularity University actually refers to by the singularity. It's this convergence between life or biology and technology. So, in 10 years time, or maybe 15 years time, in the next pandemic, we're not gonna be searching for a vaccine. We're not gonna be trying to produce a vaccine. We're going to be creating some nanorobots that are going to enter your system, neutralize the virus, and then extract them and use them in the next patient, right? Or maybe not even. So this is gonna be revolutionary. And uh, well, you wanna talk about tourism, but I guess this is another no, segue no, no. to talk about food. Let's yeah, let, let me let me uh, but just backing up a second. Um, what one thing that I wanted to share is I know, a couple is when you think about your own life and what you're good at, it's typically things that you love doing and things that you have done over and over again. And for me, what's really interesting, you know, I'm, I'm teaching classes at an MBA school, she's in Khan University, and about the future and global communications. But when I think about it, in high school, I was afraid to take any class that had public speaking. In a university, I pretty much refused to take any classes that had anything to do with public speaking. And then I find myself training hundreds of people of how to speak on stage and also teaching this course in MBA. And who, how did that happen, right? In in my, somehow things shifted in my life. Or, you know, even, I'm not a, a, a true academic, but yet I'm in a very academic world right now as a professor without an MBA degree teaching MBA classes how did that happen kind of thing it it wasn't because i went to the top university and got the top academic scores 
it was all the other things that actually led to that. And so I think it's kind of an interesting example of really unleashing or at least understanding everybody's potential and where their areas of passion are in a more holistic way and assessing that and saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not wonderful with grammar. Yes, I can use Grammarly and that'll help out a lot, but hey, you are, you know, let me do this and you do this. And we all work together to create something amazing, but we understand how we can complement each other. And we do that in a, in a caring, supportive way. Wow, that level of creative collective intelligence just gets, you know, really elevated. But right now we're kind of having to hide our areas of weakness because the system is requiring us to have strengths in every single area and take all these different courses and things, which is good because a lot of times when there's something you're not interested in or you don't have knowledge about, you take that knowledge and you connect it and then those aha moments come. So it's important to learn things that you may not be really excited about just to allow your brain to make those connections. But that shouldn't be the emphasis and how we're judged. And I, I just wanted to end that in regards to the context of learning. And like you said, we should all be able to learn at our own pace in our own way. And if we take these courses and we show we have the aptitude, isn't that what we should be hired for? And Harvard University has now dropped the SATs as well as the UC schools. Wow. They're no longer asking for SAT requirements. So that number that we are being judged by is going away. And the thing that's interesting is in a lot of top tier uh, institutions, educational institutions, there was so many people that were already perfect. So how do you distinguish the perfect from the perfect one? So that person had the score that was you know, ridiculous, but they didn't have the other areas of aptitude. And so I, I think there's definitely, like you said, a shift that's happening right now which I think is just a breath of fresh air because of all those hours we had to sit there as students and passively learn. And the last thing I'll say is imagine being a digital native, a kid that does that thinks almost they're connected with technology and they're one with technology, almost like a baby thinks they're one with their parent. And then to have them sit in a classroom and listen to somebody speak for 45 minutes is just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And we wonder why there's bullying. We wonder why there's suicide. We wonder why there's all these other things. Because when we're bored is when we come up with these different ideas. And some of them are less than positive and are not highly constructive. Right. So I'm excited to see where this shift is going and how and those around the world will all be enabled and have access to the internet, they say in the next five years. So that will also really revolutionize learning. Uh, just to close with one word that you mentioned, passion. I think this will be the ultimate driver of our learning paths and the learning paths are individual. I guess we have agreement about that. Uh, so, what about the future of tourism? Uh, you know, tourism had a lot of beautiful things and at the same time it had a lot of trouble uh, for a lot of communities around the world. It even represented a serious challenge in terms of carbon emissions from, from flying, you know, and we are travelers, uh, we are adventurers. You know, I mean, we as a species, our humanity, we, we've, you know, we walked around the earth a number of times and we only started flying a hundred years ago um, um, of course we know that uh, energy and fuel and uh, airplane technologies are going to change maybe there's going to be a high-speed train that is going to allow you to move from one place to the other in very short time or there are going to be some mini helicopter pods that look like drones that are going to drop you off very quickly somewhere and well maybe even your digital twin is going to have a, a, a level of conscience that is going to allow you to experience being somewhere else uh, where you're not which is actually uh, interesting to think about it so post-tourism for a country like costa rica i would say implies several challenges because 40% uh, of our workforce was directly or indirectly 
uh, involved in the tourist industry. And it represented $4 billion a year for a country like, like this one. That's a lot of money that is not coming in. And I'm not sure it's going to come back. But what if instead of attracting tourists that come here for 10 days and take a few pictures and take a few drinks and go back home, they came for 10 weeks or for 10 months and they do research, they telework, they engage with the local culture, they enrich the orange economy, uh, they incubate, they start up, they experiment, they, they pilot, they prototype, they link uh, businesses to their other realities. And we start having a different kind of human interaction under the same umbrella of, we under, of what we used to understand as tourism. So post-tourism, maybe we should also look at a way of coming up with a different name for it because it's not going to be the same. Uh, the tourist industry is calling it extended stay. Uh, there is a bill in Congress in Costa Rica that is calling that is offering or creating a visa for digital nomads. So if, if you can telework uh, and you work online, then you can come to Costa Rica and work from here and you'll get a visa for it. And obviously you're not gonna get uh, taxed for your work here. You're gonna pay taxes wherever it is that you pay taxes. So these are interesting ideas that are starting to come up. Uh, also, I don't know if I should say this, but well, a very big, a digital company, transnational company that is based in Costa Rica has just announced to its, uh, its collaborators that in January they have to uh, move away from their original contracts and move into virtual contracts. And this implies legal changes, uh, cultural changes, insurance changes, uh, how teams are going to work, the use of technology, the use of space. And these companies are starting to release a lot of the real estate where they used to have thousands of employees. So this is a major disruption uh, that also makes us think, okay, well, if Twitter employees don't have to go back to the office, could they work from Costa Rica? Of course, why not? You choose your time zone and you choose your your uh, tourist destination in Costa Rica where you want to live for a few months of the year maybe when it's winter and it gets cold and dark wherever you are so these are all possibilities coming out of this post-covid paradigm yeah it's uh <laughs> it's a big topic if I was to think about it in regards to being an acupuncturist, for example, and, and what would be the, the key kind of the needles that I would put in to, to really be precise about my response. It's a few things. I mean, one, the first thing that came to my mind is I remember when Peter uh, Diamantis introduced me to the uh, ANA ANA team that was doing the X Prize. And originally they were uh, thinking about, I think it's called teleporting where the actual humans were teleported. We were transferred to another place and they found out that that wouldn't be possible for quite a while. And we're only able to do that with a few particles. So they kind of threw that idea away. And then they started to pursue an idea around creating avatars. And there's a couple of reasons why they did that. And you're talking about disrupting your own business, right? And this was, I don't know, three, three years ago, four years ago, something like that. But there was a couple of reasons they were saying it is one that people, a lot of people aren't traveling because they're, let's say, fear or age or health or whatever. So a lot of people do not have that mobility or the resources to travel to different places. Right? There's a huge percentage of the world that's not able to do that, right? So if we're able to start digitally taking people different places that's interesting and then they you know they share that when you're you know in a virtual reality situation that your brain is thinks that you're actually experiencing things so all of a sudden your brain actually thinks that you're experiencing these different experiences you're having without experiencing them now the 
there's a little bit because of the technology, the visual side of it isn't quite there yet to make it feel there's still a little bit of a gap in our eyes ability to see something and the virtual reality, but that's that gap is getting narrow and narrow and I think the our brains really believing that that's that we're doing that. If you've ever done anything virtual reality and you've seen your body react or you think something's coming out or whatever you're you're really experiencing that and they talk about all that the powers and impact around that so if you imagine the tourism scenario in a virtual reality scenario or if you're actually in somebody's body per se and you're traveling around with them and you have like this one-on-one -on -one with somebody who's going through a forest or does shopping with you does your shopping for you and they're in the shop or whatever kind of thing right it's quite interesting how that'll shift things but I don't think anything replaces and everything is moving energy and everything is vibration. So it's, it's hard to, re, your brain may think it's happening and experiencing it, but the deeper level of the spirituality or humanity of actually being sensorial and really, really smelling and feeling that energy of that place cannot be replaced probably now there'll be a lot of invitations where people have smells and things and they you know they'll, they'll do everything they can to create a situation where you come closer to thinking that's your reality but at the end of the day it won't be the same right and then there's the other part which i think you alluded to a little bit which is the actual human being there and being part of the community and part of the ecosystem now you can simulate that online as well and so mm -hmm. what I see, which is really, and, and you know, I've traveled over 90 countries. I've worked in 15 countries. I mean, I've had, I've seen pretty much the world many places, many times. And I was always traveling. And this is the longest period of time I have not traveled. And I actually have very little desire right now to get on a plane and go anywhere which is bizarre because that was so hardwired in my body for the last 20 plus years. And now that shifted and I find myself becoming more connected with my environment around me, right? So I think maybe we'll be more precise about where we go and what we do. Like you said, if you're gonna, if you wanna go somewhere for a week, it's very different than going somewhere for three months. And the choices you'll make will be quite different. And so I think this kind of visa that you were mentioning earlier is quite fascinating to think about, okay, if I wanted to go and spend three months somewhere, where would that be? And I think for a lot of people, it would be probably something connected with nature. Now, I happen to love where I live. I'm in I'm in the Shibuya Monte Sando area near what's called Yogi Park and Meiji Shrine with all of the boutiques. I mean, I, I think I live in one of the best parts of the best cities in the world. And I could, and it is a very popular place for people to come. And I could see a lot of people coming to Tokyo and to parts of Tokyo and spending six months living in Tokyo because Japan just has so much to offer. And I think from that perspective, Japan will be one of the top five, 10 places in the world where people probably will want to come and experience long-term stays because there's multiple layers here. There's the history there's the kind of, uh, you know, the Shintoism and Zen and Buddhism. There's an extreme and amazing amount of nature that's here. There's the consciousness around the culture and how to treat other people. And there's the perfection and mastery of things. So if I'm coming from somewhere else and I want to really look at one of the most civilized, harmonious places in the world and, and, and have that come inside me, then yes, I would come to Japan if I could work remotely and do that for six months. I would love to come to some of the places in Costa Rica that you've been sharing with me and spend six months in the jungle or somewhere near the beach and really becoming part of that community and understanding how biodiversity works and understanding how an ecosystem works and becoming more connected with nature through the intense ecosystem, bioecosystem that, that Costa Rica has to offer. That would be another amazing place to go and, and be. Um, so you know, tourism, like you said, is a very interesting word. I don't know if it's really going to be a tour per se, like you said. Extended say, stay sounds like mm, maybe something you do to relatives that they may not like, but you are there longer than you're supposed to be there kind of thing, right? So you're right. I'm not sure what the right word for that is. Um, maybe the word living 
could be something that that would be a, a, a you know yeah i don't know if the word temporary but something living i think would be more because it's about life it's yeah. about connecting with life and it's about connecting with other lives so something living related would i think would probably be maybe the right word for something along those lines so there's this you know this kind of virtual avatar thing right that you can go in and go in different places at any time at any moment which i think is going to be absolutely amazing but then there's the other level of, they say, the sights, the sounds, the smells of India kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's that actual being in India. And I, ironically, tonight we're doing a virtual tour um, with India. We have a, a, a joint university collaboration where we're going to do a virtual tour for four hours in India. Wow. And then on Sunday, they're going to do a four hour virtual tour of Japan. And I'm going to be leading one of those four hour tours in the my area that I live in, trying to give them a sense of those places. Um, so that's the next step, really. And then is it virtual shopping? Is it, you know, what does that look like? And then all of a sudden, so many people that could not expand their worlds and experiences and understandings of the similarities and differences have access to that. And I think that will, and, and a better understanding of each other. Imagine if the people in North Korea could actually see what the people like South Korea are like are in Japan, right. or the people who have these kind of misperceptions of, or, or, or the propaganda of, of who others are would actually really get to know who those others are and see that and actually see those similarities and how ridiculous a lot of the propaganda is for right. example interesting uh you know that when you were talking about virtual reality uh it came to my mind that our imagination is still a million times more powerful than virtual reality so how do we learn to stimulate our imagination and use it to our favor in terms of being creative and uh, uh, expanding our horizons. Uh, just to give you an example, Albert Einstein never traveled at the speed of light. He only imagined what it would be like to travel at the speed of light. And then he configured that imagined experience into some mathematical equations that still govern the way we understand our universe a hundred years back. So how do we stimulate our imagination? And while you were speaking, I remembered two things. First, uh, 26 years ago, when I first took my, when I took my first meditation course, the first steps were about visualization and neuro-linguistic programming, how much you can do with your mind. And you go through this experience that I'm sure you've done, that you have your eyes closed and someone is guiding you through, a, through a, a, a narrative that you're imagining. And part of the narrative includes somebody cutting a lemon in half and squirting it in your open mouth. And in that moment, most of the people salivate, even though there is no lemon. <laughs> so the power of your, of your imagination. And the second thing is uh, my, my experiences uh, learning uh, Tibetan Buddhist mantra meditation. And when, when you're doing this meditation, your, your mind travels outside of your body and it travels outside of the solar system and it travels to the edge of light and, and dark matter, at the edge of the universe, because why not? So uh, if you're able, as a, I, I had a Buddhist monk that used to say, if you're able to imagine the tiniest point you can possibly think of, but at the same time, imagine it being the brightest source of light you can imagine. This mental paradox, if you do that, your ability to focus is going to lead you to places that you wouldn't go otherwise. So how do we train our minds to, to be more imaginative? I think that's, that's very interesting. And speaking about traveling, uh, and not with the imagination, but physically traveling. Yesterday, I got on a plane for the first time in, in post-COVID times, and I flew a whole 25 minutes to get <laughs> to my favorite destination up in the Northern Pacific, 
coast of Costa Rica, a town called Nosara, that I am pretty confident you will one day very soon visit. And I went there for work and I spent 30 hours there uh, of, overnight, of course, uh, met with a bunch of people, did a bunch of stuff, and I flew another 25 minutes back. And the experience was so profound, so uplifting, so different, uh, so much learning, so many new things that I did. I didn't have an alarm clock this morning. I was woken up by the howling monkeys. And this is priceless. I woke up this morning and I said, this is priceless. And I only traveled 25 minutes and I only traveled for 30 hours and I grew so much. Uh, so maybe we also have to think better about what kind of experiences we could have because if we could do that in 30 hours, then maybe we could be tourists once a week. And not only being tourists, but tourists with a purpose. We were partly anthropologists and we're learning from the local culture and we're partly teleworkers and we're partly community servers and we're improving whatever we see. And you try to leave the place better than you found it. And you try to leave people better than you found them. So uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of referring to the future of tourism along the lines of living because the, the, the experience that I had as a tourist in the last 30 hours was exactly a very solid part of my life. So uh. and when we think about tour, we think about we're moving around, seeing things briefly. We're, how much are we really experiencing them? The other thing, when you talked about the mind and creativity, I thought about one of my daughters had trained herself to be able to have lucid dreams. Wow. Right. <laughs> Look at your face. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Imagine you talk about imagination and creativity. If you can start playing with your dreams, that's that's a that's a different level of, of imagination for sure. Right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. That's incredible. Uh, I am mindful of the time, and it's been yes. already almost yes. an hour. Uh, what if we What if we leave uh, the, the topic of food for some other time, especially sure. because. Uh, it's been eight hours since the last time I ate, and I am still 20, 12 more hours to go. Uh, 12 more hours to go in my intermittent fasting. So maybe we talk about food some other time. Uh, okay. It's, it's been absolutely great. I've, I've taken note of a lot of the things you've said. It's been very stimulating. I, uh, I like talking to you as always, uh, and I always regard you as uh, a mentor in many ways. So I appreciate the time and I hope we do this again. It was really nice. My absolute pleasure. And it's kind of interesting that we both have doing this um, Zoom call from some kind of spiritual place, right? Where am I and where are you right now, right? If you look at our backgrounds, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually I can see in your map, uh, Northern Norway, which this picture was taken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, my friend. Great talking and, to you. Uh, so just hit the stop the recording maybe, I guess, right?